I'm from MSE, and actually I have a 50-50 appointment with MSE and ECE. So you can see it's actually a cross-boundary between material science and electrical engineering, especially um, microelectronics areas. So I actually, at the Texas A&M, I worked for 12 years as a faculty, moved to Purdue as a faculty um, in 2016. And since then, I've been working on a variety of things. I think we have a couple of slides, you know, I put together. So uh, I felt fascinated, by the way. Uh, I graduated in 2002. Since then, 20 years exploration of material science in the forefront of developing new material, new composite material for microelectronics, photonic devices, and a variety of things. And my area is, yeah, is really on ceramics. Yeah, if you keep going. Yeah, so just to show you, there's a lot of tools. As a material scientist, as an experimentalist, you got to know many of the interesting tools. Uh, one of the tools I would like to highlight is the deposition tools. I think, I, I believe Aaron today will talk a little bit about processing. So whatever design you are making, AI uh, devices or new devices, you have to make them into you know, the actual device using materials. So that's what we do and also variety of characterization tools to make sure your material really grow as what you designed and as the device designer designed. Anyway, so I think uh, there's a couple of things. I was asked to put a couple of slides to highlight Intel, the importance of why we invited Intel as one of the representative to highlight uh, semiconductor industry is really they set up the Moore's law. This has been guiding the industry for the past, I, I don't know, many, many years is it since 1970s. Uh, so basically every couple of years, you, you double the density of the chips on your chips. So basically Intel benchmarked almost all the milestones in those you know, major milestones along the industry uh, development. So I would uh, highlight to say Intel has been the leading frontier or uh, pioneer in terms of the uh, IC fabrication development uh, on chip integration. I think uh, I also have a slide. I, I, to highlight some of the major uh, maybe uh, device development to benchmark those marking periods. So hopefully that will give you some idea. I think the slides will be shared with all the students. And uh, I tend to put the, uh, the assignment as the, on the easy side. You know, you just need to read a little bit, maybe answer the question. Many of the questions are open-ended The question. Hopefully through the question, you will get to know a little bit about material processing in every steps of, you know, IC fabrication process. So I will stop here. I think, okay, one very important thing is to introduce Sarah. So we are very honored to have our alumni actually graduate from MSE 20, nearly 25 years 24. back. 24, 24 years, years back. Ago, yeah. And he graduated as a bachelor first, then master uh, in 1998 and 1999. Yep. And uh, then since then, he worked at uh, Intel. I, I think Arizona side since then. He loves uh, Arizona. Anyway, so then he made the from individual contributor all the way to the current uh, position, which is the director for advanced quality system at the Intel uh, Arizona side is one of the big boss in that site. And also, I want to say he, he's actually worked various areas. One of them is really on the back ending processing, quality and the reliability control, and recently received the MSE uh, Outstanding Alumni Awards in 2023, just last year. But anyway, I will leave the podium to uh, Aaron so that Aaron can introduce. Yeah, OK, okay. go ahead. Thank you, yeah. thank you. I think I'm good. So that was a picture of my wife and me um, this summer. I was very, uh, uh, very appreciative of, of an award I was given. Before I get going in my talk, I'd like to take a selfie of, of myself. Is that redundant? Selfie of myself. I don't speak your language very well. Selfie, so everyone can believe that I was here, because I don't think people would. So act like you care, if you don't mind. All right, good enough. All right. So, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm uh, really uh, thrilled to be here. I love Purdue, and I love Indiana, uh, and I love Intel. It's been, uh, it's been a great opportunity for me to grow as a person, uh, intellectually, professionally, um, and I will tell you a bit about my journey today, a little bit, and then a little bit about Intel and kind of what's happening in the industry. 
Um, so let's, uh, I can advance the slides, can't I? Okay, first a bit about myself. This is me in 1992. Anybody from Laporte here, please? Anybody know where Laporte is? Okay, that's good, I'll take that. All right, so uh, that was me when I was in high school. Um, but I, as Professor Wong said, uh, I finished graduate school here in, in 2000, and it shows on, um, I guess, my background that I graduated with my bachelor's in um, 98, and then uh, my master's in 99. So it's kind of a weird situation. I didn't do my master's degree in one year, but for the last semester of my undergraduate, uh, studies, I was offered a chance for early admission into grad school. I think they basically needed another TA, and I said I would do it. So I, it looks like I got my master's in a year and a half, but it was, it was two years of work and research. Um, so I started with Intel uh, right after I finished in 99, uh, and uh, I went to New Mexico, a place I had never been, um, and was there for about four years. In between, and this is a picture of the site in New Mexico, which is in a city called Rio Rancho, just to the north of, of Albuquerque. Um, beautiful area, actually. Great food. New Mexican food is very different from traditional Mexican food, at least that I grew up with. Uh, really, really good. Uh, we enjoyed our time there, uh, and I spent a year in Santa Clara, California at Intel headquarters uh, in between. In 2000, end of 2003, I took an opportunity, and that was, by the way, this was one of the key things that we did here was we started up the first high volume manufacturing 300 millimeter wafer facility. So that was when the industry was transitioning from 200 millimeter wafers to 300 millimeter, and Intel was the first to do that uh, in the industry. Uh, and so the, the first high volume site was in Albuquerque, and, and we worked on that, and that was a, a really great opportunity. In 2003, I wanted to chase kind of a, uh, a technical interest of mine, and I went into more of the semiconductor packaging, which as a material scientist really was interesting to me. So you have all these really difficult material problems that you have to solve. You've got a chip with a certain coefficient of thermal expansion. You've got a package which, with a different coefficient of thermal expansion. You join those through solder, and then you cool them down and you get cracking and all sorts of bad things that happen. And so there are a lot of materials problems to solve there. So that that opportunity in the TD world uh, brought me to Phoenix. This is a picture of Intel's assembly test technology development facility in Chandler. In 2006, I wanted to come back to the fab, and so this is our, uh, a picture of our fab site, also in Chandler, but about seven or eight miles away from the facility uh, where we do the, the packaging technology development. Um, so my focus generally in the fab world has been in the back end of the line. Um, so this is going to be uh, vias and interconnects and thin films, um, that type of work. I'm not a, really a transistor guy. I know enough to survive and speak the language, but um, I'm more uh, experienced in the back end of the manufacturing process. Uh, eventually, I transitioned to uh, the role of, from a, the role of an individual contributor to a manager. That was a big uh, change for me. I didn't think I would ever do it, and the opportunity presented itself, and I decided to take a risk and go do it, and it's been, uh, for me, it's worked out well. I'm able to have, as a manager, uh, I have more influence, more ability to affect change, which is something that I uh, personally am, uh, I enjoy doing. Uh, so, in 2016, I took another position, um, and, and that's what I'm doing today. Uh, and, and so I run an organization um, where what we do is we have a number of different things we do, but we, we use automated uh, methodologies to detect uh, problems in our manufacturing processes. We standardize through automation the responses. It's, in, in some cases, you could call it AI. We use machine learning methods to do that, um, and we aim to reduce our cost that way, but also standardize decision making. So it's not about eliminating jobs as much as it is being consistent in how we uh, address data and data anomalies in our manufacturing process. So that's a little bit about uh, me. Let me tell you a little bit about Intel and a little bit about my current team. So here's a, this is a map of, of the manufacturing sites uh, at Intel. So we have more 
we have many more sites around the world doing design, but this will focus on, on my neck of the woods, which is the manufacturing and technology development space. And so I put a couple of stars to give you um, on, on some of these sites to give you a feel for where my career has taken me in, in the event that uh, you might find that interesting. The green stars are where I have traveled for work for Intel, and I don't even like traveling uh, very much, but I've had a lot of opportunities. So I've been to Oregon, Arizona, New Mexico, Ireland, Germany, uh, China, which is Chengdu, uh, Vietnam, and Malaysia. Uh, and my current team uh, resides in many of these places. So I have people in, in my organization in Oregon, Arizona, New Mexico, Ireland, no, sorry, nobody in Ireland, uh, in China, uh, and in Malaysia, and then a couple other spots. I have uh, some in Santa Clara, California, and some in India as well. So I get, it's a, it's a challenge to have meetings with your entire team because the time zones uh, make it kind of tough. So that's an adjustment um, that I have to make. And so a lot of times my, my late afternoons are busy. That's when Asia comes into the office in the morning and the, the US is still in the office. Um, and then sometimes in mornings, my manager actually sits in Ireland. Uh, so I'll have to catch him in the morning, but it's all very workable. And at Intel, uh, since COVID, we've taken what we would call a hybrid uh, first approach with regards to work. So I have a fair amount of flexibility in terms of when I'm in the office. And a typical week for me now is two days in the office, maybe three days in the office, and then two to three days working from home. And that's, that's pretty great. Like that's actually made me kind of think, rethink how much longer I'm gonna work because I like the flexibility. So as long as I'm enjoying the work, and I can still have that flexibility, I'm, I'm really happy. And so the, the hybrid work has been, has been good. And I think Intel remains very committed to that. Um, they see it as, a, uh, I think, as a chance to give people the work-life balance that they want, which helps them retain talent and attract talent. And you all would be the talent we, we hope to attract. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit more about Intel. Um, so I've got some numbers up here in the middle you'll see what our values are. You, you can get a feel, I mean, this isn't just lip service. We, we set our, what we would call deliverables around these values. Uh, so we care about customers. Uh, we wanna be innovators. We, results matter, so we're driven by results. One Intel means we try to do what's best for the company in our decision making. And this is a pretty big one. It's easy to get self-centered in your work. Um, so this, this keeps us in check there. Inclusion, we'll talk a bit more about data around that, but that's including everybody. That's not just uh, diversity, for example, but it's also when I'm in a meeting. I wanna make sure that I'm hearing the inputs from everybody there. And so if somebody's quiet, if I'm being inclusive, I try to pull those people into the conversation to hear their thoughts. The quietest people in the room often have great ideas and sometimes we have to tease it out of them. That's one way I try to role model inclusion. Quality, which is my area, uh, matters, and then integrity. This is, shouldn't have to be said, but you know, we're gonna be honest and transparent in what we do. Now, you can see some, uh, some data around here. I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but I wanted to show, because in case it was on your minds, and all of this is available on, on Intel's website, so you can find this. Uh, but at the end of 22, you can see what the, uh, what the makeup with regards to ethnicity uh, and gender was at Intel here in the US. Um, if we look at what we've published, uh, you know, we've met our goals in terms of uh, pay equity and other actions that we were taking uh, in the late uh, 2019 timeframe. And then we have these goals that we call rise goals. We were trying to hit in 2030. And so they have to do with a number of different things regarding this rise as responsible, inclusive, sustainable, and enabling. Responsible has a lot to do with the environment and where we work. Inclusiveness, we kind of talked about. Sustainable, again, uh, it can involve the environment and other um, uh, considerations. And then enabling is really enabling people, enabling people. So my assessment of Intel, and I've only worked at Intel, so I guess I don't know any better, but my assessment is it's a very fair place to work. Results are valued uh, above all, but that doesn't mean that you can get results at any cost and still be okay. So you can get results and be 
a uh, dishonest person and that's not gonna go well for you, right? Not that I've seen dishonest people, I really haven't had those interactions, but the point is it's not results at all cost, it's getting results the right way and, and uh, you know, working as a, with a one Intel mindset. Okay, a little bit about the technology. Professor Wong stole my, stole my slide, but I added stuff to it, so it's gonna be okay. So this is, this is gonna be kind of the last 25 years or so of, of innovation. Um, and as you'll remember, this is when I basically joined the company. We were at our 90 nanometer node. You probably will know that you know, the, these designations are generally meant to reflect the dimensions of certain critical features uh, on, on the chip. Uh, and, and what you'll see here is a transition uh, to some very different uh, approaches in terms of uh, transistor design. So these are all what we could often refer to as planar transistors. They're the classic um, you know, metal oxide semiconductor kind of look to them. Uh, in 20, at 22 nanometer, um, and I want to say this was, gosh, this is probably 2013 or so. Anyway, don't, don't quote me on that. But uh, we went to, we were the first in the industry to move to the FinFET transistor. So you can see uh, a very different look when you, when you do cross sections of, of the transistors. Um, as we move forward, we've, we've been evolving on that transistor uh, design for some time. If we look ahead uh, at uh, 20A, uh, we're gonna move to another transistor which we'll call ribbon FET, which is, uh, uh, well, I'm not the best person to talk about it, but it's, a, it's, it's the next major shift in transistor design. So Intel, if you look back at the history, has always led on transistor revisions. Not small revisions to get more performance, but major changes in terms of how they're designed. So I would expect the industry will follow, uh, and they'll probably call it something else. But when we go to 20A, which is going to be later this year, we're gonna have ribbon FET uh, out the door. Uh, so let me, I just want to point out here, I'm over on this left one. Um, this is where we are on this chart. So uh, two years or so ago, we announced this, this kind of audacious goal to deliver five technology nodes in four years because we had fallen a little behind. We had made some decisions that had affected our ability to deliver this 10 nanometer uh, technology node on time. And so our competition has caught up and passed, and so our CEO said, well, we're gonna catch up, and we're gonna be extremely aggressive, we're gonna deliver five nodes in four years. So right now, in this process, we essentially have delivered Intel 4, and that's the product that we call Meteor Lake. And you're gonna hear it branded as the AI PC, because on, on one SOC, it's got all the components to, be, to bring AI away from the cloud and out you know, into, the, into the device in your hands. Uh, so I'm sure there'll be some marketing around that, as we move later into this year, Intel just, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this later, but uh, Intel 20A and Intel 18A are going to be, this means, A means angstroms. Uh, these are going to be delivered uh, later this year. In fact, I think we just pulled this one in today, but I have to read the press a little more closely. If you can click on that top one, let's zoom in there. All right, so again, Professor Wong showed this Moore's Law thing. Moore's Law is you kind of double the transistor density every couple of years, and you don't have a lot of big cost to it. So if this was not a straight line, and this was not on a logarithmic scale, it would it'd be shooting up through the roof, right? And this is, this is an unbelievable thing. This is, what ke this is what keeps the economics of semiconductor development moving. Uh, if you don't do this, you struggle to reinvest to build the next generation of, of process technology. So a fab nowadays, one fab, at the scale that Intel builds, is gonna run between 15 to 20 billion dollars. Um, and so there's, there's a reason why there aren't many players left in the game. But our goal is to get to, and think about this in your, you know, in your head, by 2030 to get to one trillion transistors on a product, one trillion. I mean, it's kind of hard for the mind uh, to conceive that you can put that onto you know, a piece of silicon about an inch or two square. Go ahead and go back, please. Oh, I screwed that up. There we go. And then let's click that one on the bottom. Now, this is important, I think, to understand um, because when I was looking for a job in 99, if you look over here on the left, 
you see a lot of companies over here, and I wanted to do semiconductors. That's what I, that was what I was interested in. Um, so you can see this list of companies, uh, in, and this is, this is 2004 to 2009, so this is the 90 nanometer node. This will show you all the companies that were, that were running technology on that node. It's a pretty long list. You move it into 2010, 2012, it gets about cut in half. So AMD, everybody loves AMD. AMD couldn't keep doing the manufacturing. They essentially washed their hands of it. They couldn't continue to invest. Uh, and so they split off. Glowflow there is Global Foundries, which you may have heard of, which is a, uh, another foundry company that will do manufacturing for other design uh, fabulous companies. You move into 12, 2012 to 14, get shorter and shorter, and to where we essentially are today, this is, chart is a little bit old, but this has not changed. So you are left now in the world with three different companies that are actively pursuing Moore's Law. And these are the companies that have to invest that $20 billion to build a new fab. Uh, and the reason it's so small is because not many companies have $20 billion in the bank to be able to go and fund uh, the build out of their new factories and their new technologies. So this is the reality. Uh, now what, we'll talk a little bit more in a, in a minute, but two of these three companies, uh, Samsung and Intel, are what are called uh, IDMs, Integrated Device Manufacturers. So the design and the manufacturing is done in the same company. TSMC is just a foundry, so they provide tools for fabulous customers to uh, build and run their products. But all three are, uh, we are all actively chasing that Moore's Law. So big reinvestments to deliver the next level, the next node of technology, smaller dimensions, better performance, uh, and it's a pretty relentless effort that it takes. Okay, let's go back, Hannah. And then we can go to the, I'll go to the next slide, I guess. Okay, so a little bit about, I'm, I'm kind of bouncing around here, so we'll get off of just Intel and let's talk, let's talk industry. Uh, one slide, mildly technical, um, but I will tell you a bit about um, what quality and reliability uh, means in the semiconductor world, because uh, it's kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, the difference between quality and reliability, a lot of people can use those terms synonymously. Um, you know, strictly speaking, we would not use them uh, synonymously. So quality is generally, does the product work when you get it? So you go to the store, you buy it. If it's a computer, it boots up, every, you're, everybody's happy. So at time equals zero, quality is what we're measuring. Um, when we talk about reliability, we're talking about you pull out your laptop three years after you bought it and it does not boot up. That's a reliability problem. So time is greater than zero. And the mechanisms that can drive those types of issues can be very different. Um, so let's look at this curve here. This is, this, is, uh, this is an important curve, and it's not just semiconductors, um, but it relates everywhere. So this is what we would call the bathtub curve. And I got this off of Wikipedia, Wikimedia, or whatever, um, and it does a good job representing uh, uh, the concept here. So the red line is what we would call early life fails. Uh, in the olden days, we'd call them infant mortality fails. And what that means is the product starts to fail. It fails at a higher level, but it, the failure rate ramps down very aggressively with time. So these are going to be failures that might happen in the first 10 or 20 days of when you get a part, right? Those are infant mortality failures. And they're very frustrating because they're very easy to see. Uh, our, our downstream uh, vendors like, let's say, a Dell. If we have a, uh, an infant mortality problem, Dell is going to see it in their factory lines when they're taking our chips, putting them on their motherboards. If you look at the, if you look at the yellow line, this will be what are called wear out failures. And this is going to be more intrinsic material limitation. So you have an oxide. It only has a certain amount of lifetime, depending on how many cycles uh, it runs at, what voltages it runs at, what temperature it's running at. Eventually, the materials just wear out. So that's kind of the useful life of the part. And so this blue line is meant to be uh, sort of a summation of these two um, curves here. And so with the, that's why it's called a bathtub curve. It's kind of shaped like a bathtub, I guess. 
Um, so this is decreasing failure rate early, and then in the middle you get this constant failure rate. Just this very low level of fails that just randomly happen. There's really not much you can do about it. And then eventually the parts wear out. This is the region, by the way, that when you're looking at buying an extended warranty on something, this is what they're selling you right here. Think twice about the extended warranty. It's probably not you coming out ahead as the person who's selling it to you because they understand this curve. They're not selling you a, an extended warranty in this period, they're selling it out here. So what we try to do in the semiconductor world is we try to screen out all of these early infant mortality failures with our tests and our stress capabilities. So when, just like if you were to buy a car or a car gets manufactured, I assume they start it up, maybe they drive it around a bit, they wanna make sure everything's working. We do the same thing at our end of line with our test. We wanna make sure it works, we also can stress it at higher voltages, and we can try to weed out some of these defects. So this is a lot of the world that I uh, live in. So things do happen, uh, and when things happen, your brand name really represents who you are and how your customers feel about you. So we have to respond well to issues when they happen, and they do happen. We try to make them as infrequently as, as infrequent as possible, but when they happen, we wanna respond fast, and then we work to locate where everything is. So if we had a manufacturing problem, we have capabilities that my team has helped build to say where every single CPU, for example, is. It's shipped to Dell, it's shipped to HP, it's shipped to Lenovo. Uh, we know where all that is because we, we've made those investments. And that allows us to be very clear and transparent with our customers in the uncommon event that we do have an issue. So there is a, uh, this is, this is showing you, meant to show you here uh, a couple of defects, right? So these are metal lines. And uh, what this chart is trying to show is the size of a defect, right? So this is, gonna, this is gonna determine whether you have the likelihood of reliability failures for these smaller to medium sized defects to infant mortality failures where they're, they're bigger but just not big enough to have them cause a catastrophic failure at time equals zero, and then you have these big defects, which means you test it at the end of line and it fails. These are some of the defects we really worry about. That would be something that looks like this. So these would be metal lines, and then this, these would be, di the dark is a, like a dielectric layer, and that's meant to be an insulation between these metal lines running in opposite uh, uh, voltage biases. This eventually will short out, that dielectric will break down, and it will happen later. So we wanna screen as much of the stuff as we can uh, ourselves. Okay, I probably need to move a little faster. Okay, so what's next for Intel? So I mentioned IDM, Integrated Device Manufacturing. So IDM 2.0 is where we're going. So we've always been an IDM. We design, we manufacture. Uh, IDM 2.0 is where we're moving now, and it's, it's kind of a marketing thing, but uh, some of the differences, as I mentioned earlier, by the way, Intel and Samsung are the only IDMs out there chasing Moore's Law. So IDM 2.0 means for us that our manufacturing technology, we're gonna make it available to other companies that are fabulous. So I don't know who these deals are happening with, it's not my neck of the woods, but just familiar names, Nvidia, AMD, you know, any, anybody else could be people doing wireless stuff, right? They can use our services now. And that's one of the things that's really driving our expansion of these factories. We will continue to use external manufacturing partners as well. We are actually customers of TSMC. There are certain products where it makes financial sense for us to fab them out versus have them manufactured internally. Uh, what does it mean for Purdue, IDM 2.0? To me, it means opportunity. So the, there's a major factory expansion happening right now across the world. Uh, one of them is happening nearby, which has been called the Silicon Heartland. Um, if you, and then we've also got stuff going on Arizona, New Mexico, Ireland, Poland, Malaysia, Germany. Crazy build, crazy build out. Can you click on this one on the lower left? Okay, so Ohio, big deal. It's not Indiana, but I'll take it. It's a neighbor, right? $20 billion is what we've announced we're going to invest there, and with, with the ability to scale that to a $100 billion investment over the next decade. Initially, we expect that that'll bring 3,000 direct Intel employees to the site, uh, create 3,000 jobs, and then as typically is the case with these types of things, this is a brand new facility in the middle of a bunch of fields right now. This is just a rendering of what it will look like, but that'll also bring expected, an expected 7,000 jobs to support the construction, to support running the factories. So it's a whole ecosystem that has to build up. 
Not unlike a, an automotive ecosystem where somebody has to supply all these parts. We have our own supply chain. Um, so I actually saw a picture of this just this week. Uh, this is, there are walls going up here. Um, and I think this is trending towards a 2026 kind of uh, opening. So I hope all of you will give that a look. Just today, Intel had a, uh, what they called an Intel Foundry Day. And so I just caught this while I was uh, in the 30 minutes before I was getting ready for this and I added this real quick. So Intel just signed as part of our IDM 2.0 strategy. Uh, Microsoft is gonna be a major Foundry customer for us on Intel 18A. Uh, and we have announced the roadmap down the road. So we remain on track to retake the process technology leadership by the end of this year. Actually, it's being pulled in a bit. So the execution is going very well right now for Intel. Uh, and as we lead in technology, we would expect that uh, more and more customers uh, will follow. We have to execute, um, and then good things are going to happen. Okay. So, uh, one point here I wanted to make. So I love Indiana, right? I love it. This is, this is you, if you're from Indiana, you're my people. If you're from Purdue, you're my people, okay? Uh, I don't wanna discriminate, but this is where I grew up and I, I love it here and I love Purdue. And so uh, I didn't have the opportunities when I finished school because I wanted to pursue semiconductors. It was a great time to be looking for a job right before the dot-com bubble burst, if any of you have heard of that. Um, but all the semiconductor opportunities were elsewhere. So I had three offers from IBM. I don't think any of those jobs would still be around today. Uh, I had two offers from Motorola, which I'm sure those jobs would not be around today. Um, and fortunately, uh, I had an opportunity with Intel, and that's where I honestly wanted to be. But what you all are gonna get now is uh, this resurgence of, of uh, domestic semiconductor manufacturing. And so you've heard of the CHIPS Act probably, Oops, shoot, darn it. Um, you've heard of the CHIPS Act. That's one of the things that's gonna provide support for this growth coming back uh, here to the, to the US. Um, I caught a couple of just article snippets, right? So Skywater is coming here. I'm not overly familiar with Skywater. We don't, we don't tend to compete with them at the moment, but I know they do a lot of government business, so they're gonna bring a fab here uh, into West Lafayette. That's a big deal. Um, I saw online searching around that SK Hynix is apparently uh, kicking the tires around here. The Intel just sold its, uh, many, its uh, memory business to SK Hynix. Uh, and, and the rumors, which I don't have any inside info, but Google tells me that uh, they're looking to bring uh, a packaging uh, facility here uh, to Indiana. And then uh, you might be familiar with Media, MediaTek. Uh, so they're a design company and they partner with Purdue and other things. So there's this this really great growth uh, that's happening right now uh, in um, the Midwest and Indiana in particular. And so you're gonna have opportunities I didn't have and I think that's fantastic. And I'm, I'm really excited about what uh, is in store. So let me finish with a few thoughts here. I have till 10 after I think was the goal. Um, the semiconductor industry is expanding. The, the current hot item is AI. You hear all about AI, right? That drives a ton of compute, a ton of um, hardware and software innovation. And it's, I do think it's a game changer in terms of, of what it can do. And it's certainly good for the semiconductor business. Moore's law is not dead. Uh, we, we showed you some data that that trend continues. Um, in terms of, of what Intel looks for, so, most engineering fields, there are opportunities at Intel, right? Chemical engineers and material scientists are gonna be more like process and fab oriented. Electrical engineering is gonna be a little more design oriented. But at the end of the day, I work with all types. So in my organization, we do, some, we do a fair bit of data science stuff. So I, and I have two people in a group in my organization that have PhDs in theoretical physics. So there's a lot of opportunity um, for a lot of different uh, uh, disciplines. I'm a big fan of material science. I like physical process, so if you haven't made decisions yet, I'm sure that they would accommodate you over in the materials side of the house, uh, but you, you have a lot of options. We want problem solvers. 
Purdue's gonna teach you how to problem solve, it's gonna teach you some fundamental science, it's gonna test whether you can take those things in. And it's hard at times, but as you work through it, you're gonna build these muscles that allow you to solve problems. Uh, what you learn here is gonna be very fundamental, and then when you get to a company like Intel, we're gonna teach you what you need to know to be successful in that environment. Um, we want leaders, and we want great people to work alongside. It's that one Intel kind of mindset. So we want a great culture at Intel. So you can't just be smart. I tell people when they ask for career advice, if you're, if you're super brilliant, Einstein brilliant, you can get away with more with not being able to work with other people. But if you're a normal smart person, you gotta be able to work with other people to be successful. So keep that in mind as you're working in teams. Are you helping other people? Uh, are you holding them accountable, right? Those are the kinds of things that will help you in a professional environment. I, wanna, I have a few things here listed, and then I'll be done. Uh, here's some opportunities to continue, that you could consider exploring if you're interested in the semiconductor industry. So uh, in the backup here, I guess we'll send a PDF out later. Uh, there are QR codes you can scan for the different disciplines uh, that will allow you to apply for jobs for those disciplines, so chemical engineering, uh, materials engineering, so on and so forth. Um, there are other investments, though, that uh, have been made uh, to help you. So uh, there's the Purdue Summer Training Awareness and Readiness for Semiconductors. I met with several students today that have been participating in that. Sounds like a really neat program. Uh, uh, my understanding is Intel's made some significant investments here. So there's a link to this. Um, and then there is also a class which uh, the Intel, the Intel uh, HR liaison asked me to include that they call Semiconductor 101. It's a partnership between Purdue, University of Texas, and Intel that is basically kind of an introductory class to, to semiconductors. And so it's a self-paced thing, uh, and you can go and you can mess around with it, and again, continue to explore and see whether uh, those uh, this industry uh, is appealing to you. My hope is that you will find it interesting. It's been a wonderful, uh, uh, experience for me and uh, it's brought me here and I feel very fortunate to have been able to spend time with you today. So thank you for the attention. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. So uh, thanks to all the TAs, they collect a few questions from all of you and I pinpoint a few of them, not okay. so many. Start with the easy ones, please. <laughs> Start with the easy ones. So actually, I think a few of them are very interesting. What do you think was the turning point in Intel, the history which is cemented as the company we knew today? So I saw that's a very high level, very benchmarking question. So, so yeah. I had a slide back here. Come on with some kind of historical thing. So I don't, it was before I was born, probably. I was born in 1973, but I think, I, so my personal opinion, and I'm not a historian, but if you look in 1981, the first PC, which looks terrible, right? Uh, IBM essentially created the first PC and they chose Intel. And you know, from there, personal computing became a thing. Uh, and so I think Intel being a part of that, Intel went through transitions in its career where it was like a DRAM company. And I don't remember the exact year, but it chose basically to move into the, the CPU space. And that would have enabled uh, this PC to have Intel inside, which is a, a slogan you may have uh, heard of over the years, a big marketing campaign. So I don't know, I would say that would be a big one. You know, the Pentium processor was a big deal. None of you remember it because you weren't born, but I do. There were a lot of commercials, uh, and Intel became a big brand. Uh, and so I think a number of those things contributed. So that's, a, that's kind of a feeble attempt to answer Great. the question. Great. Uh, I think there are a few other more relevant to the topic today. Say mm, they want to know. OK, sorry. It somehow popped out. Uh, what can students do to learn more about reliability and quality testing that occurs in the electronics field. Uh, it seems very different from the general testing principles that are taught in most of the electronic courses. Okay. So maybe you can highlight some of the critical yeah. testings you do. So um, uh, Professor Wang, in, in her, the materials that she sent out, has um, 
included some of the resources that you could look at. Uh, I also included, um, oops, a more general one here in this link below. And so Intel actually has a lot of information published on quality and reliability. We want our customers to understand how we deliver quality and reliability, so we're pretty transparent. Now, one of the interesting things I'll say that was in Professor Wong's uh, article is the industry right now is facing this challenge uh, called silent data error. And so silent data error, the part works just fine. It's just every so often, one plus one equals six. And so that's a hard thing to find, right? So it's not like it doesn't function. It functions fine. It just occasionally, rarely spits out the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine if I'm a bank, I don't like that, right? And so, so we have to work very hard to test, and so we have to do a lot of special testing. And in, in that uh, article that you sent out, it talks a bit about that. But for fundamental Q&R stuff, which is basically how do we accelerate a failure? We do that with stress. We do that with high voltage, high temperature. Uh, these are the ways that we can essentially uh, find defects that are latent, as we would call them. We can stress the part, test it again, if it fails, we know we have a defect and we need to go look more closely at how that material ran through the line. But go to the Intel site if you're curious about it because I found there's a lot of good information. Great, thank you, Aram. I think this is a very interesting question. I think this, I don't know who asked that question. I really liked it. Okay, promoting someone inside the company, basically, Intel to CEO seems to be a constant, a, a, to, to be constant within the Intel's history. Is there any, uh, a lot of upwards mobility throughout the company? I, I think, Aaron, you can use your example, yeah. maybe talk about basically uh, career development opportunity when you enter Intel. You know? yeah. So I yeah. think that's a good yeah. question. Um, I'm not going to be CEO. I can say that with high confidence. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Pat Gelsinger, he left Intel, came back as the CEO. And every other CEO came internally except for one, which is Bob Swan. And that was kind of a strange situation. But um, in terms of growth and mobility, like uh, you know, Intel really encourages us to have a, what they would call a growth mindset. Challenge yourself. If you're not growing, not that Intel says this, this is kind of my thinking. If, if you're not growing, there's a decent chance you're kind of falling behind. Now that isn't meant to be, you know, create a bunch of stress. But the real, that is the reality, people are growing, and so you need to grow as well. And, and Intel is very open with people and their career goals. So if I wanna sit down with my manager, I can show him a career development plan, and he and I will work together to execute that. So there is upward mobility. The skill has to match the opportunity. That doesn't change. But if you're transparent with your manager or your manager's manager, uh, good things can happen. In my career, a number of years ago, I was talking to a few students earlier today, what really made a difference for me is I felt that there was, and this is a number of years ago, uh, a vice president at Intel who had some confidence in me. And I noticed that. And at the time, I don't feel like uh, I necessarily had these significant ambitions. Um, but because of what he saw, what I felt he saw in me, it gave me some additional confidence. And I started to think more about Hey, okay, I can. I'm. I'm. Maybe I'm not just average. Maybe I can keep going and, and envision, uh, you know, more opportunity for myself. And that emotionally and mentally for me was a big deal. But then I also had to look for opportunities and let my interests be known. What I found in managing people is if people aren't open with me about what they want, it's hard for me to read their mind and to make sure that I'm helping them with their goals. Again, if you walk in to my cube and say, uh, I want a promotion, right? That isn't how it works, right? I, don't, I, agree. I want a promotion too. I want you to tell me as we sit down, say what is it you hope to accomplish? And then what I can do is try to help you figure out how we get there, try to create opportunity, visibility. You have to be successful with those opportunities, but I can help you get those. So that's, that's a part of the process. You've got to own your career. If you don't own it, yeah, it may turn out great, but it may not. Uh, so you've got to take a, a strong ownership mindset, I think. Great, thank you, Aaron. So maybe now let's open the floor for questions in the room. Uh, too bad we cannot select everyone's question from the input. You already have Ian. any on the spot questions you would like to ask? 
Any questions? We're staying here till 5.30 no matter what, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, questions, go ahead. So Intel, as, especially as compared to a lot of other companies, has a lot of products. I know at the very least you have your GPUs, CPUs, I know you do a Wi-Fi product. You did, did memory for a little bit, but I think you said you sold that off. Mm -hmm. How does Intel, along, and now you're also an IDM on top of all of that, how does Intel balance all of these different products? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so at Intel we have these vertically aligned organizations, and these are going to be product based. So I've got a family of you know, client products that go into a desktop or a, a mobile, and then I've got another vertically aligned organization that focuses on our Z online, let's say, more for servers and so forth. So they all have things that they own, and they've got to manage them. And so the, the heads of those organizations, they deliver. Now in terms of the CEO who sees it all, how does he know what we should continue to invest in and not invest in? Well, we certainly have divested ourselves of things that they don't think are core to our growth strategy. So selling off our NAND business to SK Hynix. So we have a fab over in Dali in China, uh, and we essentially sold all, all of that business, including the fab, to SK Hynix. Uh, that is in, still in the process of closing, uh, but there are times where I think Intel looks and says, this is not core to what we want to do. So, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a 60 to $80 billion a year company, so it has a lot of products. It's got 125 or 30,000 employees. Um, you want to channel that as much as you can to the high growth, high margin opportunities. Um, how they decide that, I assume they talk to some finance folks and, and then they figure out what's the, what's the market look like in the future, because demand will determine a lot of your success. All of it, probably. Um, yeah, that's, that's uh, I haven't been in a lot of those conversations, so I'm guessing a bit, but it's a tough thing to balance. You'd like to be in everything, like Intel's going into GPUs, right? There's, that's a space we haven't been in essentially ever, and there are other companies that own that space. And so, but because they think, we think it's strategically beneficial, we're gonna, we're gonna essentially try to force our way in there and you know, carve out some market share, which I think there's a, a fair bit of risk associated with it, but it, it's strategically important, so we'll do it. Great, thank you, that's a good question. Any other questions? Last minute questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm just curious to know how your experiences here at Purdue translated to your experiences like starting at Intel. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I mean, Purdue to me is, is top notch. Um, you know, we recruit from all sorts of universities, but I know that Intel, uh, uh, Intel puts Purdue at a tier one, you know, kind of status because of the quality of the students that come out and the quantity. Uh, and I think it's going to be even more important as we bring Ohio into the mix because of location. So, I mean, what did I learn? I mean, I learned how to figure out how to solve tough problems, uh, how to really knuckle down and, and deal with challenging coursework, challenging lab work, challenging research. Um, and I, I realize to this day I still understand some really fundamental science that helps me in my job. So uh, not so much in my current job, but certainly in previous jobs, looking at cross sections of, of things I was telling some students earlier, like understanding material characterization was really helpful to me. Like I remember solving a problem or two uh, that nobody else understood because they didn't understand, for example, the interaction volume of an electron, uh, you know, uh, from a scanning electron microscope under the surface. So these were little things that were really kind of technical, very specific to the coursework and the science, but that did help me. So you're gonna have those spots where you're gonna, your science, your knowledge of the engineering is gonna be valuable, and then you're gonna have a lot of opportunities where your ability to figure out how to solve tough problems, which you would have learned here and through your life, uh, are gonna manifest themselves in a professional environment. So I think Purdue prepared me uh, for all of those things. I don't think, I don't look, there are a lot of smarter people at Intel than me, I'll tell you that for sure, but I don't think anybody was better prepared uh, based on their coursework and, and what they did uh, at their university. Great. Maybe one last thing is that 
What are the key, maybe one or two soft skill you think all of our students should be developing? You know, I mean, we have the hardcore knowledge base, you know, yeah. from chemical engineering, mechanical, whatever discipline you guys are in. But what are the one or two soft skill you think that will be critical yeah. for your success? So if you interview with Intel, you're going to get answered what we call behavioral interviewing questions. And so they're not necessarily going to ask you to derive an equation, you know, and, and use all these, these sophisticated mathematics you're going to be learning. It's going to focus more on what are your soft skills or what are the skills that you have. And so we, we're looking for people that can, there's one skill that I find particularly valuable is being able to tolerate ambiguity. That's like every day. Right, what, you know, ambiguity. Like, if you can only deal with like this set of specific instructions and specific due dates and all this stuff, you you can find success, but you'll find more success if you can deal with uncertainty and ambiguity. So I think that's an important one. That's one that I look for in people that I hire, uh, because I can't tell everybody what they have to do every every minute of every day. Um, and then I would say generally being able to interact and work effectively with others is really high on the list. And that doesn't mean that you can't be tough at times and that you can't have to, that you will never have to deliver a hard message um, and that people might disagree with you. At Intel, we've always kind of believed in this idea of constructive confrontation where if you see something that isn't working, you should speak up. Uh, so it's not like everything is always, you know, happy-go-lucky, mm -hmm. but in general, you want people to want to interact with you. If people want to avoid you because of who you are and your personality, again, you're gonna struggle compared to what you would be if people found you approachable and available and somebody who's open to different ideas and wants to explore data. Uh, so I would say being able to tolerate ambiguity and being able to work well with others. I know that's, that's so cliche, but it's reality because everything is group. Everything is group pretty much. If it's, if it's not group analysis, it's there's a group because you've got multiple stakeholders and the decisions you need to make and propose. And the more they trust you, the more influence you'll have and the more success you'll have.